There's no challenge, big or small, no problem, big or small, no difficulty, big or small, that we cannot tackle. Alec, it's a pleasure to have you as my guest. Welcome to the J Curve. Thank you very much, Olga. It's all my pleasure. You are an entrepreneur of many different domains with two unicorns under your belt. And you are an art collector. I had the pleasure to appreciate the exhibit of some of your artworks here in Sao Paulo. So that's where I thought we would start. So we're going to start with you and your passion for art. Where is that coming from? <laughs> When did you develop it to the extent that you allocate a meaningful portion of your life as an art collector today? Like many things in my life, started some kind of serendipity. It was um, 2001, 23 years ago, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, I was living there, not surprisingly, under some crisis. It's very typical there. But there was very good news. It was a museum that was being built, a new museum called Malba, a contemporary art museum. It ended up being the best contemporary art museum in Argentina for sure and probably in the continent. And I got invited to a meeting at, that, at the building of that museum. It hadn't been opened yet. So there was this empty building and they invited me and some other people, 40 people. I didn't know exactly what we're going to talk about. Long story short, I leave that meeting having been elected the first president of the Friends of Malba Association. It's the Friends of the Museum. I was, um, whatever, 29 or something like, like that. Like cold turkey method, yeah, right? Yeah, so I said, like, what the hell? I mean, why, why is this happening? I wasn't an art collector. I didn't have any art studies. Clearly, <laughs> the group wanted a, a bit of a different profile to run the thing and to build it, maybe the entrepreneurial thing. And I took it like a clear sign from the universe. And then at that point, started learning a lot. I got into Malba, became closer to the, to the curator staff, eventually became very good friends with the sub-curator Ines Katzenstein, and she became the first curator of what would become my, my collection afterwards. But I learned a lot, had a lot of fun. And from there, just one thing, you know, turned into the next and a um, love story began. <laughs> so when you were learning about art, what were some of the surprising things that you discovered in art itself or maybe in you as you were learning to appreciate art? I'll make the, um, the caveat that what I do is contemporary art, like 21st century contemporary art. That's what's happening now, today, the art of my generation. I say that because there's very different art. I mean, more classic art, even modern art, which is 20th century, even less contemporary, contemporary art is quite different. The main characteristic, as I see it, of this super contemporary art is that it's too close. There's no perspective. As a consequence of that, it's quite hard to understand it. Very often, there's no consensus about whether a piece is relevant or irrelevant, important, not important. Art or not art. Very typical conversation in the art world when you look at something very contemporary. That ambiguity, that uncertainty, that big, big, big question mark is what attracts me. And having been an entrepreneur and a CEO for most of my life, I was the person making the calls. Of course, I had a team and love to delegate and all of that. But in the end, if there's no consensus or there's need, to make a decision and people can't agree or whatever, it's my call. On the art side, as I said, is a question mark. So for me, it's, I need to provide answers as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, and I get to ask questions as an art collector, an art fan, a philanthropist, a patron. Very different, It completely balances the other side. I and love that, that you put art in the perspective of entrepreneurship because I wanted to put art in the perspective of venture capital because you still need to evaluate the art, right? You still need <laughs> to understand, is it an art, like you said, or it's not an art and assign certain value to it. 
<laughs> to me, this subjectivism actually draws the parallels with how you evaluate early stage founders when they have nothing. They have like a concept, an idea, passion, and whatever. So how do you assign value to arts? What's your framework for that? <laughs> and again, to contemporary, because again, contemporary, if it's, if, yeah, super contemporary. Super actually. contemporary, because I mean, a Picasso painting, for example, would have a very liquid market. There's Picasso paintings being sold every day. There's auctions. There's lots of transactions. So you, you compare it. You look at the period. Is it a good period, bad period, better, worse? It has it been exhibited in good museums? Then you apply a formula, ask a couple of gallerists, and more or less, you know, you, you'll be with a 10% range. I wouldn't say it's easy. Yeah. It's never easy with art, but it's possible with some certain degree of clarity to establish a price. Now, you have a, a new artist. Never exhibited anything, no price point, zero. Comes up with an idea, conceptual art. So it's not even easy to find a comparable in another artist because it's something completely new. And, and you have to you know, decide how much that's worth. Is it worth what, what the gallerist is asking? Is it not worth what, well, complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> Just like very often with a, with entrepreneurs, you know, when they get started, venture a very early stage venture capital. Yeah, and different things applied. Let me tell you the kind of process we follow. So we try to deal with gallerists whom we trust, and they prepare some context and try to sell the company. More or less like a lead investor in a round tries to sell the company to the other investors. You know, they they more or less help the entrepreneur build a case. That's what the galleries do. Then there's the subjective thing. You know, you meet the artist just like you meet the founder. And you say, well, do I believe this guy's serious? You know, is he really committed to doing something cool here? Will, will it be producing more art? Or will it just, you know, next year decide to go surfing and, and this is it, you know? That's not good for art, by the way. You want... You want to buy art from artists who will develop a career, who are really passionate about art, where this is the beginning of a, of a very cool, long story, an epic story, ideally. So is he serious? Is she serious? Do they have values that you share? And I don't mean um, ideologies. I mean, I don't care at zero about what the political views are, et cetera, but values. I mean, do they care about humanity? Do they care about doing something good? Is what they do this is another very big question we very typically ask, kind of an acid test. Is what they do original? Or is it, you know, just replicating something somebody else did before? Once you start asking these different questions, you start getting closer to, is this attractive to us? And then at that point, you make a judgment call. Does what the gallerist asks us make sense? Or is it crazy? Sometimes it's crazy. We believe it's crazy and we just don't go ahead. Sometimes we believe it's reasonable and we go ahead. We have a budget, just like venture capitalists have a budget. You know, just you have a fund. Well, we don't have a fund, but we have a budget. And, and we have, you know, we don't call it an investment committee like you'd have in a, in a VC fund. But we do have a, a group composed mainly of the curator. Today, the curator of... My collection is called Mariano Meyer. He lives in Spain. Very, very sensitive, um, subtle, elegant, knowledgeable, deep person. And, and Erika was the collection manager, and she's also an artist. And sometimes we also get input from, from others. But that's, that would be kind of our informal, informal, formal, quote-unquote, investment committee. Twice a year, we do lots of acquisitions because, for example, there's a big art fair in Argentina called Arteva. So around that art fair, that's one of the big moments in the year. We go and we end up buying maybe, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 pieces. So it's, it's, it's big. We get lots of materials before the art fair takes place with context and pictures and prices, etc. And it, this would be like getting the, the decks, you know, of the, yeah. of the founders. And then we, during the art fair and before and after, we actually visit the studios, talk to the artists, get to know them. Then in the end, we just gather the information, sit around the table and compare everything because we have limited budget, of course. So just like 
It's a portfolio approach. Invest, yeah, yeah. So we do some more established, more expensive, I'd say, more certain pieces, which in any case, they're quite uncertain because everything I do is in that camp. But some artists have already got some track record, etc. And we also do some very, very fresh investment, meaning often we're the first guys to buy art from the artist or second, but like very, very close to inception, you'd say. In the VC world, it would be like Angela PowerPoint Dustin. type of moment, like nothing, <laughs> the other a slide, you know, an idea and a person, that kind of a moment for an artist. No? And... And then we move ahead. We close our eyes and uh, and gamble. Take a leap. It, it's it's <laughs> take the leap. Faith. Yeah. It's a leap of complete leap of faith. Yeah. That, that's why we have. I'm, I'm realizing that after your questions, I'm finding lots of parallels I hadn't realized between both worlds. So originality. Mm. You mentioned. Yes. Is it original? It almost brings me to this idea. Is the founder contrarian? Yes. Okay, yes, contrarian, but how contrarian can you be in the market where you have VC that are ready to pay for a specific product given specific timing and specific state of the market, right? How do you balance or maybe think about balance of being original enough to prove that they have like a fresh perspective, fresh idea and being commercial, I want to say, or mainstream enough to prove that they can sell? Here, there's a distinction between both worlds, the VC one and, and the other one. I'm, I'm going to make it. And it's my approach, which is not the typical approach. But in my approach to collecting art, the main driver, it's going to be a slightly long answer, but you'll, I'll get to the... I love your long <laughs> answers. Keep going. <laughs> so the, the way we do this and the driving principle behind our collection is to help develop the local art scene in Argentina. That means we make some choices that are very specific. For example, we only buy art from living artists because, of course, only the living artists can contribute to the scene. Furthermore, we only buy from the artist gallery and pay the artist the money. I don't buy from another collector or an auction because if we do that, the money doesn't go to the artist. We're not pushing the local scene. Given these principles, of course, the other thing I never do is I never sell an artwork. I've never sold a single art piece, nothing, because that doesn't promote the art scene. It goes in the other direction. Therefore, the issue of whether the art piece is going to be worth a lot, is it commercial today or commercial tomorrow, doesn't really enter the equation. This is controversial because most people who have a collection, you know, they have their Excel spreadsheet and they're kind of assuming they're doing an investment, not only philanthropy and you know then art can be actually a very interesting asset class some people have made fortunes by collecting art and i respect that very much and i hope you know that eventually my collection will be worth a lot because i love the optionality that brings and eventually somebody will have it either a museum or my kids or somebody and it's good if it's worth a lot i love that more value is better than less value always having said that it's not my priority today for several reasons. The first one is, as I said, the principle that doesn't push the agenda of the local art scene forward. But the second is, it's very hard to predict what will be commercial in both worlds, but in the art world particularly. So I don't even try. My bet is, is it beautiful? And beautiful doesn't mean necessarily aesthetically beautiful, but is the idea beautiful? Is the concept beautiful? Is it important? Important is a very big question that appears very often in our conversations in the quote-unquote investment committee for art. Can it become important? Do we see it becoming important? Very seldom we have a conversation, do we think this will go up in price? You know? So you mentioned it's not about the beauty, like physical beauty, but it's more about the beauty of an idea. What is the artwork in your collection that is beautiful or the most beautiful to you today? And what's in the idea that you think makes it beautiful? <laughs> well, there's one art piece that was actually there in the exhibition at the Tominotake, which is at the same time aesthetically, aesthetically beautiful, but the idea is even more beautiful. It's a very big blue painting. 
it's a vertical map. It's over three meters tall. So that's, there's, I don't know, like 12 feet tall or something like that. And it's, it's very tall. Like it doesn't fit normal, normal size ceiling room. And it's this huge map where every town and street, city on the map is real, but they're all in the wrong place. It's a map to get lost. I find that such a beautiful idea, a map to get lost. It's by Guillermo Cuitca, great <laughs> artist. Because we live in this world. We have watches and schedules and Google calendars. Everybody is regulated and controlled and influenced by the context. And uh, we have to do this at this time of the day. And we have meetings and we follow procedures and do this this way or that way. And the trains arrive at a time and leave at another time. And traffic goes in this direction. You can't go the opposite direction. Like we live in a world where everything seems to be regulated and controlled to make it more efficient. You know, it would be, imagine if everybody could do whatever they wanted, it would be chaos. But the idea that in this context, somebody spends a lot of time and energy building a map where if you follow it, you will for sure not get to where you want to go. It's fantastic. You know, I find it so relaxing, so I'm relieved because at some point you, you, you want that. You want to just let go of everything. Just accept everything, smile and go. You know, it's this idea of being in, in the middle of the desert and just walk, you know, whichever direction, it doesn't matter, you know, or the, or the beach with no stress, no uh, hurry, nothing. And also the name is excellent. It's called, it's called Everything. Everything. Yeah. I bought it in New York. The gallerist, she made a joke. She said, no, well, now you're buying this piece. It's called Everything. Now, as a collector, you have everything. You don't need to buy anything else. <laughs> so whenever I decide to stop collecting, I just look at that piece and okay, mission accomplished. <laughs> we have everything already in the collection. So when you cool. think about this 20, what, close to 24 years interacting with artists, what did you learn from them? And how maybe, because your entrepreneurial journey was very aligned with your journey as a collector. So how that art part impacted your mindset as an entrepreneur and what are the key learnings from the world of art, from artists who operate in completely different reality in my perspective? There's many, many connections. For example, the one immediate connection is that one wouldn't be possible without the other. Like to do the kinds of things I do in the art world, that requires money. And so to spend that money, I first have to make it. But also it gives purpose to the other one because then I can think of making money as an entrepreneur or as, a, or as an investor. And I have a cool purpose of what to do with the money. Very different when you are focused on making money just because you want to make money, which is perfectly fine. But I think it's less intense and less, less of a life goal that you know, I want to make money because I have all these very cool things I want to do with it. It buys me freedom, et cetera, it's lifestyle, whatever. But also, I have this fantastic plan of spending it on art and through that building a legacy of a body of art that might be reference for the future, that might change people's minds, that might help artists continue building culture for the future with all kinds of good ramifications. I know how you think about that as a mission and as an incentive to be in the business world. I'll ask one more question on the art topic before we transition into your entrepreneurial reality. I don't know how frequently you get this question, probably very frequently, but when you think about the role of AI, you know, I just read this book by Rick Rubin and I was listening to this episode with him on Tim Ferriss' show and they had a very interesting conversation about AI in art and how much of an impact it will have on both how artists create, but also how artists think about creating and how you think about the value of art as something that becomes essentially less personal and less human yeah. with the growing role of AI. So I'm wondering what's your take on this? Interesting you mentioned this. The, the whole exhibition here 
collection, which is the second chapter of a broader exhibition called Un Lento Venir Viniendo, which means a, a slow coming, basically, um, because it's Argentine art coming to Brazil in three stages, first to Rio de Janeiro, and now to Sao Paulo, next year to Porto Alegre. Porto Alegre. Now, in, in doing that, you, know, you have to pick a theme for each, each city, and the theme for Sao Paulo is the copy based on Houdin Nielsen, a local artist, who actually his technique, his main technique, was to photocopy himself, photocopy his arm, hair, face, torso, etc., and use that, build art with that. The first guy to do it in, in 40 years ago, but for most of his life. Now, the copy and the original, that goes to the core of your question about AI. Because all of a sudden, there will be art, which, as you said, you know, it might be produced with some kind of artificial intelligence. So who's the author? Is that, is that an original? Is it fake? Is it a copy? Is it replicable? Can you do a hundred of them? How original? How much of a fake? How much of a copy? Is it better? Is it worse? All kinds of complicated questions. Let me tell you one experience I had, which I think is a good anecdote. A few years ago, I was invited to the Vatican when Pope Francis became Pope, he was Argentinian, but he's Argentinian, and he wanted to make the treasures of the Vatican more accessible to the world. He comes with this very Franciscan approach of caring about the poor people, etc. So the Vatican, the, somebody decided, okay, let's do something cool for the Pope, and so invited people from, mostly from the U.S., like from Facebook, Google, etc., the big tech companies, to brainstorm about how to use technology to make the art more accessible to the normal people. Because there's all these treasures in the Vatican that are not being shown to people. But they said, okay, listen, the guy comes from Argentina, the Pope, who actually is in that intersection of art and technology in Argentina. And I appeared, you know, probably searched me or something, I just appeared at the top, Complete serendipity, but I was there. So they invited me as well. So you had all these huge guys and me for four days thinking in the Vatican about how to use technology to make it. And it was, we could have a 10 hours of conversation of those four days because it was so spectacular. But let me tell you one anecdote, which has to do a bit again with the topic you brought up. At one point in time, we go to the Sistine Chapel. So we have the beautiful Michelangelo frescoes over there. And the very smart, very humble, was a bishop. But I mean, whomever, this cleric who was in charge of the Sistine Chapel. So he comes and says, what are you guys doing? Well, we're thinking about using technology to, so, so we can actually you know, take all these treasures and make them more accessible to everybody around the world, and blah, blah, blah. So, interesting, interesting. So he looks at us and said, just let me tell you a, a story. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people come here and they look at the frescoes. And every year, a few get into ecstasy, the, the physical ecstasy, which means you start contorting and uh, it's almost like an epileptic fit, something like that, you know, ent enter into a trance. Sometimes they need, you know, to be hospitalized and sometimes, you know, they just, complete ecstasy they vibrate and we don't understand nobody understands it but it happens time and again also with the david in florence the statue of the david apparently there's something with extreme beauty that when you actually connect to it feels like lightning but the point he was trying to make was the following he said well this happens over and over every year here i never saw anybody enter in that state looking at a screen. So what he was saying is, there's a very different, very different connection with art when you connect with a real thing, human-made. I don't know if it's quantum physics. I've got no idea what it is. But it's not the same thing to look at a painting or look at the sculpture, be with it, or to look at it through a screen. And that would make me think that maybe that artificial technology building something potentially is a bit more artificial than the other thing built by a human. And therefore, the impact 
of that artwork on the rest of us might also be different. No idea. Too early to know. Maybe I'm wrong. But I remember that anecdote. I want to switch to the entrepreneurial side of you and talk about the very beginning. So you started your first company, Derimate. 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 Yes. Sorry, my that, accent that, sucks. No, it's, it's just because that, that means Derimate. Derimate. Me, means at auction. Arremate is an auction. It also means totally crazy. And that combination was actually a very, very powerful combination, you know? Like, uh, yeah, you say, está loco de remate, which means he's really, really crazy. Or está de remate, he's at auction. And it was, it was a nice, nice brand. So it was a sort of eBay version for Latin America, right? That's correct. And you started in 1999. That's correct. August. August 31st. So while I was listening to this other podcast with you, one piece of data really struck my mind that it took you about 150 calls <laughs> and meetings to raise money. with investors <laughs> to raise money. Yes. Then fast way forward, you know, you sold two companies, like you built two tech unicorns, sold them to one of the most impressive global investors. So how does it feel today thinking and reflecting back on that experience and how did it feel start the business overall? <laughs> well, you don't know what you don't know when you get started, right? So I didn't know that, it, that there were a lot more effective ways to raise money than just calling everybody. <laughs> I had never done it before. So what did we do? We sat in, in a room and actually in different places, but I was in Buenos Aires and most of the team was there. And just, you know, say, okay, you want money? Okay, let's talk to banks. So we started talking to banks. But then, of course, we realized that most banks don't do that. By the time we got to the fourth bank saying no, they said, no, maybe you have to talk to some other people. And then those other people say, well, yeah, we do that, but not for Argentina. You know, we do that, but not that early stage or not in the tech category, whatever. And eventually we got to like, we more narrowed it down to relevant people. And the relevant people, you still, there's a lot of them. So maybe there were 30 or 40 relevant people. And so the 120, the first 120 were kind of irrelevant, but they helped us identify the relevant ones. And then once you were there, well, it was just a matter of narrowing it down to the five or six who actually had interest in doing a deal like, like Berremate. And then eventually that ended up with two groups um, co-investing and us raising the $12 million on the first transaction. But by the way, just so the people don't think I was completely dumb when, it, when we did this in the time of the, the remate, there was no VC industry in Latin America. It was zero, 1999. Zero, yeah, zero VC industry. Internet connectivity in the region was 3%. So 97% of the people, which is everybody basically, didn't know what internet, let alone the remate, they didn't know what internet was. So this is a completely different world from today. So obviously I'm not suggesting somebody who starts a business today follows the same the same path. No, it's a very different, you have to, you have to do what works in your moment, right? I mean, your track record <laughs> is self-explicit. It's really hard to think that you're stupid. <laughs> Einstein said, we're all stupid or geniuses depending on, on, on the focus, you know, if you ask, if you ask a fish to climb trees, it's going to be very stupid. Ask a dog to, or a monkey, a monkey said to swim, it's going to be very stupid. Now you can ask the monkey to climb trees, it's going to be a genius, or a fish to swim, it's also going to be a genius, no? But the problem is society, you look at education, it's the same one for everybody. Everybody goes to the same school, the monkey and the fish. The, maybe you're a monkey, maybe I'm a fish, but we both go to the same school. So we're going to be stupid and, and geniuses, depending on which classes we're taking at different moments every day. It's ridiculous, but that's the way it has been since the 15th century. And for most of us in the world, it probably will still be that way. It's amazing how hard, hard it is to change some Education. things. Yeah. Ridiculous. But that's another, Never another podcast. Never. Another. <laughs> we can do it in volumes. You know? <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, 100%. So back you, to you, the you're, learnings. You're back to the learnings. Maybe one of the bigger things besides the specifics about, for example, how to raise money and all of that, is the importance of building um, a team that makes sense. And let me define make sense. 
again, I had never done this before. So before being an entrepreneur, I had been a consultant. Very different. You know, we, we thought we were smart and You were with BCG, one yeah, of the BCG, premier you know, consulting firms. You, 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 yeah. Your brain was to believe that you are the best of the best and that everybody is, you know, whatever. Not so best, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and then you did Harvard Business School, yeah, and which is could it even be better. Me, just imagine. <laughs> Amazingly, I survived both experiences. <laughs> no, after that, I mean, it could have been, you know, a complicated You could have ended yes. a <laughs> Imagine an impossible person. But thank, it must have been the friends or a family or something that, you know, more or less kept me normal, kind of. Can I just get back to that? So after BCG and Harvard. Five years in BCG, yeah. Five, five, five years in BCG, Harvard. Why, like, why did you start a business for Latin America? Because actually in Harvard, we had seen, it was the very beginning, eh? There were just very few companies. Amazon actually became well known while we were there. Google didn't exist. eBay did and um, AOL did. But we had seen that and eBay, eBay represented an enormous um, share of e-commerce transactions, like 30 or 40% of all transactions anywhere in the internet space. So it, it proved to be like a phenomenally attractive model for buyers and sellers. And it had a trait that made it super attractive to us. You didn't need to, like AOL, you know, build a huge infrastructure. And if you were lucky to get the, the chicken and egg going, meaning buyers attracting sellers and sellers attracting buyers, you were more or less lucky with that. Then it kind of grew organically. The problem is it was taken already in the U.S. because eBay was there. So we said, okay, well, well, well then where if we based? Because we were in Latin America, it just seemed, you know, Latin America, is, when you add it all up together, it's quite a big region. It's bigger than China altogether, similar to China. So we said, okay, maybe we have an advantage here. If we are from here, we have connections, we can do this quickly. There was a um, huge rush in terms of speed. Hundreds of teams around the world, this is pre-dot-com bubble. Everybody was looking at stocks going up every week, 10%, 20%. People becoming millionaires very quickly. Money flowing in at unprecedented rates. And then people thought, okay, how can I not be there? We have to be there. And it became an issue of first mover advantage. How do we do this so fast that we actually grab the treasure before everybody else? In that context, we just thought that Latin America was a place where we could do this quicker, quicker than, than, than in other places, and quicker than anybody else trying to do this in Latin America. There were still 42. We, 42 teams trying to be successful with the quote-unquote the remate model. And 42 that actually raised money. There were more, but 42 that actually raised money. So it was highly competitive because everybody, and rightly so, time proved thought that this was going to be extremely attractive. Fast forward, look at Mercado Libre. It's a, um, whatever, $70, $80 billion company. 76. Well, cool to be there, right? But in the end, it became a duopoly between the Remate and Mercado Libre. In the end, Mercado Libre won, and we sold to them. So they, they bought the Remate. We were the only company, besides Mercado Libre, of course, that actually had an exit. The other 40 just shut down, which is, by the way, quite typical of operating in technology. More or less 90% of the players fold and return zero. Maybe 3 4% make money, significant amount of money. But then 0.1% or so, you know, kill it and make... Um, an extraordinary disruptive return for everybody. That's in this case, it's Mercado Libre. And, but everybody wants to be there. So you're willing to take all kinds of risks to be there. So I think this speed is the consistent <clears throat> sentiment across the businesses that you built after. Yes. Like I remember I read in the Fortune article about you building Olex and why you decided instead of focusing on slow organic growth, you decided to 
sell the company to Naspers to partially leverage the advertisement muscle. And then you did all this stuff when, in dot com when everybody were trying to scale through internet and PR and you did the TV advertisement. <laughs> so was it when you kind of the idea of the necessity of maybe the idea of speed and time to market and time to dominance as a competitive mode of this type of business? Was it when it emerged in your mind that you replicated this idea along the way? Was <clears> it like <throat> the first aha moment about speed? The, the thing with, with aha moments is that only ex post do you know whether it was a aha moment or a huge confusion, you know? Post-mortem analysis. Yes, a post-mortem analysis. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we identified something that, that was interesting for us. In the early days of OLX, there was a huge overlap between cable TV users, paying cable TV users, and internet-heavy users. There was like an 80% overlap, phenomenally high. And this applied to many countries. So people who were used to transacting online, not only being online, but transacting online, being comfortable paying and delivering items and receiving items, etc., where many of the early adopters who also were those who actually had internet connections earlier could pay for them or were interested or whatever and who also had cable TV. So by using cable TV as a means to target internet users, you could get to the core users, those who actually make big difference, you know, the heavy users who would, of course, eventually spill over to all the others. This was based on analysis, but it was a big bet because nobody had done it before. And it was kind of expensive, even though it was, we thought, when you did the calculations well, cheaper than any other alternative, it still required a lot of money, dozens of millions per geography. And we were fortunate because our investors, we had in, initial investors were some excellent investors, um, that, like the Founders Fund, you know, Peter, Peter Thiel. Thiel. Um, Bessemer, yeah, Jeremy Levine there. And, I love Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy. He's one of my he's favorite consumer investors in the world. He's a genius as well. He was in our board several years. Joel Cutler from General Catalyst, also a very, you know, like all these guys, have, have, they're titans. Okay, there's books written about them, no? But then they were bought by Naspers, and Naspers also bought a minority part of, of the shares of the founders. With Naspers on board, the dynamic changed because Silicon Valley people, I mean, they're, they're the best investors in the world for technology. That's unquestioned. But they also kind of follow... Uh, a playbook. Yeah, a playbook. That has been proven. There's a reason why they follow the playbook. In moments where there's a lot of disruption, sometimes not following the playbook and being a bit more bold, especially if you can afford it, it makes sense. We had these guys from Naspers, South African guys healthy guys, you know, very simple in the good way people who had been very successful investing in Tencent in China and were very hungry just to, to do things around the world. And they looked at us and said, well, how can we do this, you know, 10 times faster, not 10% faster, 10 times faster. And we came up with this idea. We were completely aligned and we did it. And yeah, we very quickly became very relevant in Brazil, very relevant in India, in a few Eastern European countries, in Portugal as well, were super relevant quickly. Ukraine, Poland. You became um, massive in, 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 in India. In South Africa. Yeah, yeah. So in many, many of these places, in um, less than a year, we became from completely unknown to a household Come brand. Household in India, at one point in time, I remember we, we're in the same bracket as a soda. I don't, I don't remember which one it was, but Coke or I don't know, some of those really, really established big brands that have taken 100 years to build. So it was, it was impressive. Those things, there's some non-insignificant investment in analysis that needs to happen for those decisions to be made, of course. But there's also there's a bit of luck there, you know, that the right time, right place, right everything, and I think the 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 the, the merit is in the boldness, 
is that once you do the analysis and once you think you're not late, that actually decide, okay, let's jump, you know? And, and there's always a bit of not knowing whether the pool has water in it or not. And that, that, but that, that, that's, I think, one of the things that sometimes, in the good cases, differentiates entrepreneurs that, you know, that, that end up doing bigger things from others because you are willing to run that risk. It can go wrong, by the way. It, it can go wrong. It does go wrong sometimes. But still, being able to make that call and bet the farm from time to time, I think is the way to go. Certainly goes with my personality. So if you were to write Oleg's playbook in terms of opening the markets, you opened India, I think, was the first market, right? You completely avoided developed markets. You didn't really, I don't know if it's still true, but the company didn't allow the transaction to happen on the platform to avoid dealing with legacy payment infrastructure at a certain point, which I thought was really interesting way to, to hack the growth. But what were the other things, like if you think in terms of playbook? Yeah. I think the playbook needs to be very adjusted to the moment and to the reality, the competitive reality you're facing. So in our case, this was 2005, very different from today. Okay, but that's when we launched OLX. For example, there was no mobile back then. I mentioned that because that came with LetGo and, and that, that just, we used another playbook for that, which was also very, a bit of a pioneer move. But for OLX, so the first thing we realized was that what we wanted to do was, would be super hard in any of the developed markets because there were already established players doing this very well in the US, in Germany, in England, Japan. But there was a group of countries, the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, that were at the same time growing. They had large populations. They were transitioning from offline to online quickly. And there was lots of investment coming in. And we decided to focus on, on them. The interesting thing to, to your playbook question is, how do we do that? Because it was very strange that a French entrepreneur, Fabrice, my partner, and an Argentine entrepreneur, him living between France and the US, I living between the Argentina and a few other places, would decide to do Brazil, Russia, India, China. Countries, in many cases, we had never even visited. So how did we come up with that list? And we applied something for the playbook we call the Martian approach, which is interesting. It is just a simple Simple. We just branded it that way internally. But if you were a Martian, you landed on planet Earth back then, 2006, 2005, and decided, okay, I want to build this OLX, land exchange, the OLX company, and we want to do lots of transactions, use goods, blah, blah, blah. Where would you do it? That's the big question. Why the Martian? The Martian has no strings attached. The Martian has no preference for Spanish speaking or English speaking. He's a Martian. He's arriving here, doesn't know anything. Just knows that he wants to build this company. So he will only care about factors that impact decisions to actually build. And when we actually you know, wrote them down and prioritized them, very quickly, Brazil, Russia, India, and China came on top. And that's what we did. Later, it seemed very obvious, you know, it's the BRICS, obviously. Yeah, but that wouldn't be the case today, for example. I would not do BRICS today for lots of reasons. It's actually the opposite of BRICS today. Back then it was BRICS. So the playbook has to do with being a Martian, being a, maybe it would be just be completely objective. Forget about your preferences. It's got nothing to do with your preferences. It's got to do with what makes sense for the business. Erase all your preferences, subjectivity, the whole thing. And with that, completely clean slate. Think where, what, when, with whom, etc. No? That's one thing. The other thing, which is, I think, quite non-standard that I would include in the playbook, is have fun. And I, I mentioned this often, you know, this idea of having fun. Because I learned it the hard way. I didn't have a lot of fun in my early career. I thought that discipline and 
being early to work on the last to leave to go home and suffering a lot. The acid test, am I doing the things well? Yeah, did I only sleep four hours yesterday? Fantastic, you know, this is the way to go. Have I not talking to anybody and not seeing any friends? Great, that means I'm really committed, you know, like uh, I, am I suffering and losing hair? Excellent, you know, the, the body is reflecting the level of commitment. <laughs> my level of commitment and effort and everything. This is going to be great. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It's quite the opposite, actually. So, When did you realize that, by the way? It's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, so, sometime in, in the middle of the OLX adventure. Okay. The middle, not the beginning, but the middle of the, and then definitely afterwards. And we learned that, I learned, I think it was a collective thing, that when you have fun, all kinds of very good things happen. You think a lot clearer. You can think more boldly. You can, you don't have, um, you don't restrict anything. Think of when you are doing something that you really like, you're having fun. It's like energy flows, you know, ideas come nicely. You are creative, you're inspired, you're credible, you smile, people believe in you. Think about when somebody tells you, you have to do that, you know, and you dislike it, and you, but you still have to do it. You're bored, you're trying to force yourself to make it happen. You're completely not credible. You don't motivate others. It's a lot less effective. Now, the issue is, okay, if, if being in that state of having fun makes sense, it's a prerequisite to being effective, how do you manage for that? How do you make sure that everybody's having fun? That's when it becomes a bit complicated because there's no Harvard playbook or Harvard manual that says, how do you, you know, how do you build a company where people have fun? And it's not normally what people focus on, you know, if people don't focus on whatever the, make sure you have the best IQs or the correct gender mix or the age thing or the experience, whatever. Not necessarily that people have fun, but, but I'm convinced of it. So kinds of things you can look at that would be in the playbook. Make sure people can make fool of themselves without consequences. Because when they can make fool of themselves, that means the environment is not dangerous. You cannot have fun in a context where you are threatened. You know, you're in danger. When you're completely yourself, you can be foolish. And that's fantastic. That means you are relaxed, which means you're not being threatened, which means you probably are having fun. So you need a, a certain level of foolishness, informality. Some rules, but not many. Very few rules that count. With that kind of context and the productivity of the team, it's not 10%, it's 10x through the roof. You, you sort of get all kinds of energy and ideas and real results that you certainly would not have in a more standard and typical context where you're here and this is your, your job description and these are the goals and, uh, and this is what everybody else does and now this is a time scale, this is your card, make sure you do this quickly and by the way, the guy in the other desk is doing it very fast. So careful, you know, and, uh, and this is a bit of an upper, upper out culture. And so in six months, we'll tell you whether you stay or you jump out the window. Like, man, not the most, you're going to be good. You're going to be fantastic in that context. You know, you're going to, you're going to do everything not to be bad, but you're going to be fantastic because you won't, you won't take risks. You won't really think out of the box. And it's very hard to, in a competitive world, it's possible, but very hard to win against everybody not thinking out of the box. Playing the same game that everybody plays. Sometimes you do win, but man, it's a lot of effort because you, it means you are the absolute best in everything because you're playing the same, you're running the same race. You have to be the fastest all the time. Whereas if you can play a different game, you know what? I'll let him run. I'm biking. Or I'm actually paying somebody to, to run, you know, instead of me. It's what cool engineers do. Maybe the smartest engineer I know of, his name is Diego. And he always says, well, I'm cheating here, doing this or that. No? Things of ways to program that are more efficient, more elegant, but he doesn't use the standard approaches, never or very seldom. 
and and it, it works, you know. I actually cheated with the podcast because I was so bullish on tech ecosystem in Brazil, but I don't speak Portuguese. <laughs> and I didn't feel like investing time in learning Portuguese to the extent that I can speak to the founders here would be a smart time and energy yeah. allocation. So I came up with our, my own solution. <laughs> it seems to be working. Look at us sitting here. <laughs> I was really curious about your approach towards opening the markets because you've opened markets that are characteristically, culturally, regulatory, like everything was different about those markets for Olux. So what was your approach, I guess, towards learning and educating yourself on the market mentality and nuances as you like literally grew at such a rapid speed? How did you do that? Some of the things you mentioned, like regulations and culture, deep culture, um, are more relevant in some businesses than others. What well, we identified relatively quickly, we had the same platform, OLX, the exact same products, just translated, same, same exact thing. At one point in time, in like 80 countries or something like that, huge, I mean, all over the place. The cool thing is we could actually monitor and understand the funnels and the conversions and what users did in all these markets and compare, compare them across regions and geographies. And we found something very impressive. Contrary to what we've been told, people all over the world are quite similar. The governments make it difficult and complicated, you know, and so there's a different... There's different currencies and different languages and different traffic rules and different laws and different regulations and different everything. But people, with it, we have the same DNA. Like our DNA is like identical. So what we saw is that 99% of the times what worked in country A would work in country B. Granted, our model was very light. We're not very much inserted in, in anything in the countries. It's like a classified platform, you know, just connecting buyers and sellers. If you have to get into a lot of logistics and payments and all the rest, well, then it becomes a bit more complicated. There you have a lot of rules that could impact you and the banking rules and all of that. But just connecting buyers and sellers, that's one of the reasons why we could do this very quickly because whatever worked, wherever we tested things, we rolled out immediately almost no adjustments, and it works. This is counterintuitive because people say, no, you have to be global, you know, global, but local. So you have to go, and yeah, of course, to, you have to be, for example, operating the language of the place. Not a lot more than that. In our experience, again, this doesn't apply to every business model, okay? But in our business model, mostly worked quite well. It was actually a lot more important to, to run the tests and run, run them well, <laughs> get to the right conclusions, the rollout was actually quite simple. We will not talk about uh, let go. I will leave it for the second um, volume. But when you think about this consistency of your success, if you were to distill maybe three, five, your interpersonal characteristics, or whatever else is relevant that led to this seemingly continual success, what those would be? Things that I re do repeatedly and hopefully have some weight in being able to do things that we've done. I trust people a lot. I delegate a lot. I'm not a micromanager. So there's a lot of trust both ways. That saves an immense amount of time, allows you to do things very quickly and also very effectively. Second, I'd say try to be very transparent about what you do and why you do it and communicate it because that allows people to understand whether they agree with you or not. And if they agree with you, that's fantastic, and they're going to be happy. And, and if they don't agree with you, likely they'll tell you, and then you decide what to do. 
but you don't have those issues where people are surprised and then all of a sudden, you know, there's conflict. Conflicts and problems are, they destroy the efficiency of any team. It's a distraction. People focus on fixing the conflicts and solving the problems as opposed to winning the competitive war. So if you can apply an antidote to a situation turning into conflicts, etc., beforehand, that's fantastic. And in my experience, that means being radically transparent. Sometimes at a risk, because sharing a lot of information, you know, allows every team member to misbehave with that information. But in my view, I'd much rather trust, trust everybody and share everything than risk the fact that, you know, down the road we'll have a problem because people will not understand why I did this or did that or thought we we're going to go in right and we're actually going left or, or the reverse. That would be the second one. The third, I think, would be spending significant time to verify and validate that the timing for what you're doing is the right one. As we said, you know, OLX followed a strategy in 2005, which would have been completely different if we, if we tried to launch some kind of a trading platform in 2023. It would be different geographies and different strategy completely. We would fail brutally if we applied the same strategy. So the same strategy is not good or bad per se. It's good or bad depending on when it's implemented. There are not, no good or bad decisions in my experience. They're timely and untimely decisions. Understanding that is very important. Think of it. No good or bad decisions, no good or bad strategies, just timely or untimely, which means you need to understand where you stand in terms of the moment. Sometimes people don't do that. They say, okay, that other guy, you know, did this or that, so he was successful, I'm going to copy that. Yeah, but he did it in a different moment, you know. It's not applicable anymore. So the team, transparency, timeliness. This is very relevant. I think it's a number one mistake that entrepreneurs do. They don't really understand what their time is. For example, with Letgo, we, we not, didn't go much into Lego, but just to give you an example. Lego was a mobile, to simplify it, a mobile OLX. The Remate was a Web 1.0 trading platform. OLX was a Web 2.0 advertising-based, super light trading platform. Lego was a 3.0, it was a mobile app, also a trading platform. Now, if we hadn't understood from the beginning that we're transitioning from web one to two, meaning all the advertising-based models were coming, we would have never come up with OLX. If we hadn't identified mobile, that's a big disruption, in 2015, 2014, 15, we we're very early, we had mobile solutions for Lego before almost any of our competitors, big or small. But we understood. It was a big bet. We thought everything is going mobile. Now, when 1% of everything is mobile, that's, that's, that's a bold idea to have. And we had, a, I remember, his name was Simon, a French guy. He was the head of mobile. Simon was not in the office. He was in a different place because of preferences. He just lived in another place. And so he had a lot of, he's not contaminated by group thought or what everybody else thought. And yet he had this idea. His task was to build mobile. And he did it not realizing that what he was doing was unreasonable and irrational and impossible, like everybody else thought. So had he been contaminated by everybody else who was defending all the web models and having a vested interest in not investing money in this unreasonable irrational and impossible mobile future, he wouldn't have done it. Why did he do it? Because he had a mandate and he wasn't aware of, 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 of what the other 90% thought about this. He just looked at data as opposed to opinions of everybody around him, which, which is what most people do all the time. Looking at data and understanding the moment when you're doing something, phenomenally important. So that's another thing I would include in the Maybe the another one comes to my mind is bring over people 
whom you could have fun with. You don't need to be best friends with everybody in, in your startup. But if you're not comfortable with them, if you feel uneasy inviting them over for dinner at your place, probably not the right person. Because when you start a company, the connections that need to happen between people are a lot deeper than if you work in a huge multinational company where you don't care who sits beside you. You probably won't see them again until Monday morning, you know, the next week. And you can be formal and distant and that's fine. In startups, when you're getting started, everybody depends on everybody else. There's no institutions, no processes, no history that guides you, no playbooks. You just have each other. And being able to take advantage of everybody's best intentions and experience is very often the key to success. And that doesn't happen unless there's chemistry. And again, the you know, touchy-feely, fluffy thing. So making sure that you have that with a very small team at the beginning, essential. I mean, and then, of course, follow the Harvard Manual and all the rest. You, know. <laughs> you mentioned that this, I forgot what's the name of engineer, the guy who developed the mobile, that the fact that he developed something that was perceived impossible was because he was separated from crowd and because he looked at data. Is it the same process for you to shut down the noise and kind of maintain the clarity of thought and contrarian approach towards whatever endeavors you are involved these days? Do you do it the same way or what is your processes towards not being muted by the public opinion? Yes. You're going to laugh here, but my answer, I don't know. I don't know. It just happens. There's some intuition happening. Intuition is basically, if I understand it more or less correctly, it's the, the aggregate of all our experiences and conclusions in our uncon unconscious mind. Everything we've learned gets somehow triggered and very quickly comes up to answer questions we may have in ways that, that are kind of almost automatic. We call it intuition. But it's far from that. It actually is a very sophisticated mechanism where our mind gets into this huge lake of all the memories and experiences we've had up to date since we were born until now, taps into that, and very quickly decides, I know this kind of problem. I imagine where this is going. This is what you should do. Sometimes we don't even understand where it comes from. We just know it. And it's the basis for our decision. In my case, I try to keep that channel you open. Trust your yes. subconscious brain. And you some, trust yes, your intuition. Yes. And sometimes I can't understand why I feel that something makes sense. 80% of the times, the intuition is right. The logic is wrong. If you're smart and you are trained as a consultant as I was or have gone to HBS and you have seen 800 cases, you can argue almost anything. You can, you can fool your brain to argue and beat almost anybody at any argument. And that's a problem because you, you can fool yourself into making almost any decision. So that's why it's dangerous to rely too much on your conscious mind's logic. You mentioned that the strategy of going after bricks would not be time relevant today, and yes. you would never do it today. You would go the opposite way. And with your fun myelin, 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 you seem to be more focused on developed markets in the States versus U US. Latin America. US. Yes, 75% US. 75% US. Why is that? Why wouldn't you go after BRICS as an entrepreneur? Yeah. And why do you purposefully spend your time investing in the States when data suggests that more and more interesting tech companies are actually coming from outside of the States? Yeah. Why not BRICS? So when 
in 2005, we started OLX. The BRICS were becoming more democratic, more interconnected with the West. There were all kinds of good things happening. And there was this expectation that there would be some kind of market economies and democratic regimes converging. The consensus was that if enough investment was poured in, eventually people would be wealthier and better educated, and they would just like to be a lot more friendly with the West, and it would all make a lot of sense. Some of that happened. Like there was a lot of growth, economic growth and openness at the beginning. Now in the last few years, it's the reverse trend. Except for India and to some degree Brazil, but for sure China and Russia, they've economically started closing up. They became a lot more inward looking. They started regulating the markets in many ways and became a lot more hostile towards the West. At the same time, a lot of money stopped pouring in. So foreign direct investment is a lot more limited than it used to be. As a consequence, as high growth markets for tech, they become a lot less interesting, you know. What we see today is that when you look at deep tech and at real innovation, most of the cool stuff still happens in the US. In biotech, Artificial intelligence, the, the topic of the moment. You think of it well, a lot of the artificial intelligence, the real disruptive artificial intelligence is all coming from the US. And you've got all the big models, say ChatGPT, BARD, and the others, all of them are in the US. Not one of them is in Europe, not one of them is in China. Even when... Europe has been spending money trying to build these things, and China theoretically had this advantage of the population, that they had more population and everybody's connected through the internet, so they're producing more data than anybody else, should be able to train these models faster and better than anybody else. It's not happening. I have some, some hypothesis about why it's not happening, but it's a hypothesis. I believe that it has to do with that topic we discussed of the fun and being able to fail. When you experiment with these things, you're likely to fail, maybe nine out of 10 times. In China, there's a lot of government control and a lot at stake. And it's like a national pride thing. Failing is a big issue. There's a lot of disgrace attached to it. People really suffer. Some people in some Asian countries commit suicide when they feel that they have betrayed their trust, their nation, their country, their companies, etc. It's the opposite in the U.S. People fail, and if it was a good try, compliment it and get to try it again. It's a hypothesis. I don't know that. But you think of the real breakthroughs in everything, in uh, biotech, in medicine, but again in deep tech, in AI, all of them happening in the U.S. today. So we're trying to go in that direction. Not 100%, like... 25% still happens in other places. We're doing a couple of deals here, a couple of deals in Europe, a couple of deals in the sky. We're doing uh, satellites and stuff. But most of it definitely is happening in the U.S. And we think it'll be more concentrated in the next 10 years. In the U.S.? Yes. The other one thing is, is rule of law. People realize that in China, in Russia, Brazil, not so much yet but the issue of rule of law became a, a relevant issue oops I own this company and now I realize that it, become, it became strategic for somebody in the government and I don't really own it anymore you know big problem right. in the US rule of law there's problems like everywhere no system is perfect but there's a lot more rule of law everybody agrees that and there's precedents and, and all the rest so the US is confused in my mind as a country in many ways today and it's polarized and the, the, the discussions are stupid and cannibalistic and, and that's bad but the whole world is undergoing lots of problems so I still believe that it's the best system worse than 10 years ago or 15 years ago 
but still the best system. Last one before rapid fire. You mentioned satellites. What are other interesting trans dynamics that you are interested in from timing perspective? I really love the value you assign to timing. So yes, yes. what are the trends? What are the industries? What are the types of companies or anything else that is relevant for the context? Yeah. I think that using AI to come up with uh, medicines, that's going to be a big one. Because it's, that affects everybody, right? Everybody wants to live longer and be healthier. And running, the, to a large degree, breakthroughs in health have to do with tests and testing the right things. Using AI and lots of data can help us identify which tests to run and just simplify the process. So I think AI might be useful there. Satellites and space, I said sky before, I meant space. Space. I think can be significant as well. Of course, you have energy and, and everything around energy, super relevant as well. I think it's, it's going to be an exciting next 20 years. Very exciting. Very cool to be an entrepreneur. The capital markets, you know, are bumpy and it's not that easy to raise rounds. If it's your first round today, in most cases, that might be the case for some time. That's slight hurdle, but history shows that usually downturns don't last too long, maybe one, two years, three max, and then hypes normally last a lot longer. And you have to be an optimist, right? Totally. So <laughs> I always see the glass half full. Let's move to the rapid fire. I'll ask you five short questions and I'll appreciate your immediate responses. Let's dive right in. The first question is, what's one book or piece of content every founder should read and why? Yeah, I'd say Man in Search of Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's a story of a psychiatrist who spends several years in Auschwitz with all the tragic experiences one can imagine. But interestingly, he develops a theory there about how, in the end, inner freedom can be completely non-affected by external things. Meaning, even in a place like Auschwitz was probably the, the worst possible environment to live in, you can survive. Now, take that into the business world. There's no challenge, big or small, no problem, big or small, no difficulty, big or small, that we cannot tackle. If you really have a mission, and the purpose is important and value-driven, I think there's few things that will stop you. And uh, I strongly recommend that book. I love that book. I read it three times. <laughs> you are throwing a dinner party and can invite any four people in the world, dead or alive. Whom would you invite and what's going to be on the menu? <laughs> okay, so um, Einstein, Jesus, <laughs> yeah, Leonardo, and Cleopatra. <laughs> and we would eat sushi. <laughs> I love sushi. It's the most <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> dinner party I've ever Just heard. Just imagine. <laughs> if you were to hit rewind and make one decision differently, what's that one decision that you will change? Yeah, I would have a lot more fun in the remate, the first venture. A lot more fun. Yeah. I lost it. all this hair here. I lost it in the first project. <laughs> so just imagine. And yeah, then they slowly grew up in the, <laughs> in the following ones. Yes. If you were to write a book about your life, what the title would be? Alex Cool Adventures. <laughs> Amazing. You are giving a public talk, but you cannot talk about venture capital, entrepreneurship, art, or any other business you're currently involved with. What would you talk about? Your life is an adventure. Alec, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to learn from you. I stepped into this recording studio thinking that I really want that to be the best to date. And I think it pretty much could be. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Olga. Big pleasure. I felt super comfortable. Your really congratulate you for the preparation. You, you did a great job in thinking this through. It made me feel, and I guess all your guests feel, you know, 
relaxed and it was smart, it was intelligent, it was creative, it was smooth. And uh, you're great at what you do. I hope you have a lot of success. You and, know, most uh, important, I have a lot of fun. And a lot that. of fun, absolutely. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. 